You are listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Today, we're in Bern. Where are we, Lionel? Where are we? We're in Bern, Richard. Um, we're right next to the Stade de Suisse, the stage finished outside the stadium here, home of Young Boys Bern, Swiss football club. Uh, it's the host stadium for Euro 2008, and it stands on the site of the old Vankdorf Stadium, which was the venue for the 1954 World Cup final between West Germany and Hungary. The, the miracle of Bern, where Hungary were 2-0 up after eight minutes and West Germany came back and won 3-2. Research, hashtag research. Okay, well, no, man. <laughs> I actually happen to know that because I came here in 1987 and went on a little stadium tour of the old Vankdorf Stadium. All right, Lionel. That was Lionel Burney. I'm Richard Moore, and we're joined tonight by Daniel Freib. Hello. I'm not sure I like the theme tune. What? You loved it at first. I don't know. A few people have written it on Twitter saying they like it. I'm not so sure. Anyway. Um, we just did another podcast of sorts. Are we allowed to say that? Yeah. Um, and I talked about, I'm, I'm obsessed with Ravella, the, the, the Swiss soft drink. I always, every time I come to Switzerland, I always drink Ravella. It comes in three colours, green, blue, red. I never know which one's which, but it's made from egg yolks. Yeah, the other, is, it alcohol- is it alcoholic? It's not alcoholic. Oh. The other podcast we did was the Rafa Cycling Club podcast for our sponsors, Rafa, for members of the Cycling Club. We're just looking back on the final week. Um, but tonight we are talking about Stage 16 uh, into Switzerland. Won by Peter Sagan. Um, let's have the tail of the attack, Lionel. Indeed, it was from Waron on Montagne to Bern here in Switzerland, 209 kilometres, and for much of the day we were treated to a two-up time trial by Etix Quicksteps, Tony Martin and Julian Alaphilippe, who broke away and spent more than 170 kilometres off the front together. Martin led the way for much of the time, but I am sure that Alaphilippe did a turn or two towards the end of their escape. There was a climb with around 25 kilometres to go where Martin dropped his teammate. Martin was then caught by the bunch a few kilometres later and then there was a quite comical sight of Martin and Alaphilippe riding, still riding together off the back of the bunch. And in fact, they crossed the line together last and second last, 12.20 down on the winners, I think. So, um, yeah, quite a nice little Madison day out for Martin and Alaphilippe. In the final stages, Rui Costa of Lampre had a go with 20 kilometres to go, but he was caught. Then there was the short cobbled climb with three kilometres left, but there was to be no fairy tale win for Fabian Cancellara in his hometown during his final tour. Sepp van Mark had a go, you know, finish that was designed for the classics riders so perhaps not a surprise that he had a go uh, but he was caught and then it came down to a sprint the bunch split a bit the strongest super strong sprinters were at the front and the big some of the big guys were dropped and it was peter sagan who pipped alexander Kristoff in a photo finish securing his third stage of the tour and it was all about the timing of the lunge no change overall Froome still in yellow Peter Sagan's in green Raphael Mike still in polka dots and Adam Yates in white tomorrow is a rest day woohoo come on <laughs> lie in bike ride yes <laughs> afternoon beer I've not seen Lionel much this tour but he's changed <laughs> he got a bit he got, he got a bit of the sun today I think um, well okay We've got. <laughs> I'm thrown by that as well. I've never seen him like that. It's most out of character. Um, are you okay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. We've got some. We've got. We're speaking to John Degan Cole. We'll hear from him. He was another. Was he in a, was he in a good mood at the at the finish? Because he wasn't particularly when I interviewed him. No. I think he might have just spoken to Richard. Actually, <laughs> I think I annoyed him. Um, what he, did you say? Well, uh, well we're going to hear oh from no. him later. We'll, we'll, we'll hear from him. We'll get to that. Oh. And. The Tour de France is leaving town with a yeah. honk. Um, yeah, his family were there, his wife. Hey. Oh, oh, come on. I mean... <laughs> that, that... I think... You know what? That's Frank Jacobs, who featured in Kilometre Zero last <laughs> week. Or this earlier this week. Frank <laughs> Jacobs. Because that is the NEP crew who do NBC... And Frank Jacobs gave us a, a few little honks there. Thanks for that, Frank. That was really annoying. Tyson, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, um, John Dinkel had his family there, his, his wife and, and kid, um, and so he was delighted, obviously, to see them. He was annoyed with himself, I think, for not going earlier in the sprint. He felt that he didn't do himself justice, but 
Um, I'm afraid I asked him a bit of a daft question Go as on. well. What was it? Um, I, I, you know, he said I could have just had one question, so I, I asked him two, and then I tried my luck with a third, which just came into my head, which was. Are, are there any other stage, stages you've identified that this, you know, in, in this tour, forgetting that we've now basically got four days in the Alps, one of which is a time trial? <laughs> what about the rest days? You're not. I kind of, the rest I, I kind of uh, changed course mid question, remembering the Champs Elysees, and you know, mm. talking of the Champs Elysees now was was a bit ridiculous. So anyway, mm. we'll cut that out to make me not sound quite so stupid. But yeah, he wasn't. He's he's quite abrupt. He can be quite abrupt sometimes, Degan Cole. Yeah, he can, um, but he usually is very good in interviews. He's brilliant um, in interviews, but you know he'd been doing a lot of interviewing with the German guys, and I think he was ready to sort of finish. He's rocking a very interesting look at the moment. He's, at the moment, isn't he? He's rocking the full kind of moustache mullet Berlin nineteen eighty November nineteen eighty nine combo. Fair to say the Alperson hasn't really, and he's leaving this team at the end of the year. Rumored to be on his way to Trek, but are you saying they've cut off his supply of Alperson? Examining, not his, allowed any anymore. Examining his hairline, I'm not sure the Alperson has really worked <laughs> for him. But anyway, um, we'll get on to that. Um, I think that one of the curiosities of today was the, the odd two up time trial: Tony Martin, Julian Alaphilippe Philippe. There were four guys trying to bridge across at one point. Surely they'd have been better waiting for them, no? Yeah, but when Tony Martin is off and running, it's quite hard to hold him back. I mean, this was what I asked Brian Holm, the Ethics Quick Step sports director, whether it was something the riders came up with or whether it was something the sports directors, um, you know, suggested. So let's hear from Brian Holm his assessment of today's uh, two-up escape by his riders. Good afternoon, Brian. Whose idea was that? Was that something the riders came up with or something the sports directors suggested? Let's call it a bit of freestyle. There was a lot we knew it was like, it wasn't no really on the paper our stage. We knew it would be too hard for Kittel in the final, for the heavy sprinters like Kittel, uh, Greibel. It could be for Kuka, we thought was wrong. Uh, for sure for Christoph and Sagan, for an hour mat, maybe. So we told the riders, tomorrow's race day, do what you want to. If you think you have a vision to win a stage, go ahead, gentlemen. And uh, then Tony went off. I just expected some more teams, you know, like who didn't win a stage, who didn't have a sprinter to try something, because it was a good day to try something. It was unbelievable hard. We saw the final, the whole bunch exploded. So I think a lot of teams underestimated it. So with a few more riders out there, some teams with bigger ambitions, you know, I think they could have made it to the finish. And uh, we did, of course, consider to stop Tony, but you know, when Tony, we called him Panzerwagen, when he's going, I mean, better don't stop him, let him go. And then poor Alain Philippe was sitting there, a bit of sore legs in the start after the long break yesterday. Unfortunately, he broke his uh, derailleur, his ski off. So, uh, but, but they did a good time. I mean, I I was a bit skeptical about it in the start, but sometimes you have to f- just follow the race also and see what's happened. And I think they did a great break, and actually I ended up being quite proud of the boys. <laughs> so how exactly did it happen? Did Tony Martin go first and then Alaphilippe went across? Or what, what exactly happened? I can't tell 100% for sure how it happened. You know, they're jumping, they're jumping, and probably, you know, maybe Tony tried to close a, a gap somebody and then, then it's just going the two of them. But but the last, sorry, the first 50 kilometers, we hoped somebody would come up from behind. So every time they got more than one minute, they was slowing down, and we hoped somebody would jump to get across because if we got three minutes we saw like then maybe the bunch gonna stop so we hope like 10 riders 15 riders like we saw when Matthews won a break like that then we knew the final would be extremely difficult to chase them down and would have a fair chance it didn't, it didn't happen and then I think sometimes you have to let the riders follow their instincts also and so we did today I mean we didn't make it but at least we can say, say afterwards which ride I mean not everybody can say that today Are you surprised that none of the other teams wanted to do something? I mean, there's now a time trial, mountain stages in Paris, and there's a lot of teams without anything to show from the Tour de France. And yet, why is that? Is it because everybody's tired or is it just, you know, know, what, what can you attribute that to? I wouldn't read it just on other teams because, I mean, it's always easier. They do their tactic, we do ours. And like we said in the meeting, gentlemen, last day today where you might have a chance to win where it's not really controlled so go ahead do what you feel like you should not finish to the France and, and said you was always domestic for Kittel or for Dan Martin if you want to win a stage you go today we don't really bother how you do it just go ahead gentlemen and so they did and I wonder why the other guys there might just be more riders with a little bit of ambitions 
We saw Rui Costa, you know, like it looked like suicide, of course, what he did, but at least you can, can say he tried. At the end of the day, cycling all, 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 always about trying. And lastly, uh, Julian Alaphilippe's had a terrific Tour de France. I mean, he's got stuck in so many times. He's, he's had some bad luck. He's had incidents. Uh, what do you think he's learning from this race? I'm not sure he's learning after the Tour. He's, he learned like uh, Tour is like nothing else on the earth. You can talk about Tour d'Italia, Vuelta, but Tour de France is just a madhouse. I mean, it's harder than everything. The speed is always two, three k's an hour faster, so it's just a pure torture every day. It's a race where you where you tell yourself the climbs every day, get me out of here, send me home, and never do it again. And when you go to bed, you say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to win, and that's like Tour de France. So it's Brian Holm covering a lot of ground there. Um, they had a fantastic Giro, didn't they? But they've won a stage here thanks to Marcel Kittel. Uh, but overall, I think we'll be a little bit disappointed. It was shades of the 2008 Hell Van Het Mergelen, wasn't it, Richard, today? Very much so, Daniel. A race I remember well. I, I often Martin, watch it on YouTube. Tony Martin's first win <laughs> as a professional, I think I'm right in saying... And um, one day semi classic, everything's a semi classic, isn't it? Any two bit nilly niddy noddy race is a semi classic. Anyway, um, this that just about qualifies. Um, Tony Martin was away with Adam Hansen, who was his teammate at the time, and they rode pretty much the whole day a two up time trial, but they held on to win that day, or Tony Martin held on to win. But alas, if it didn't any, happen today, any, did it? If anybody could have pulled that off, it would be Tony Martin, wouldn't it? I mean, we've seen him at the tour before. Um, you joked about Philippe giving him the odd turn, but every time I looked up at the screen, mm-hmm. Tony Martin was sitting there with Philippe, sort of motor pacing behind. Well, I had wondered whether the idea was for Tony Martin to do all of the work and then allow Philippe to springboard on one of those climbs near the end. But by the time they got there, Alaphilippe was, was finished. And, and he has had an eventful old tour, hasn't he? He's been off his bike, he's crashed into walls at kind of head height. Uh, he had a problem yesterday with his rear mech and while he was in a great position. Um, you know, he hasn't had a dull day, really, in this race. But the big question is, why would... When you see Tony Martin go up the road, I mean, the four that were trying to get across wasn't exactly high calibre, really. Um, but if you were... The other day, we saw that huge 30-man break. I know it was a mountain stage... But you do wonder why why not think, well, Tony Martin's gone up there. That's a pretty good ally to have. I'm going to join in. I don't know. Maybe it's not as simple as that. It might not have been a high-caliber group going across, but it's four more teams represented, which you know affects things a little bit behind, perhaps. But it was an exciting finish, wasn't it? Very fast, very, very fast. We saw Cancellara come to the front, and I was, I was kind of waiting. I mean, Rui Costa had a really good go, and... Uh, that's the sort of move I would have thought Cancellara might have tried it easier said than done, of course. The guy that really brought uh, Rui Costa back was the man who won on this date last year, Steve Cummings, Mandela Day today, and I thought he did an amazing job. I mean, you had a lone break specialist, Rui Costa, being chased by a lone break specialist behind. Yeah, Steve Cummings did do a lot of work today at Dimension Date. I mean, he's obviously ridden a brilliant Tour de France. He's won his stage, but I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about his selection, non-selection for the British team at the Olympics and I think he probably deserves to ride for the British team at the Olympics however he hasn't done an awful lot of work every day and for Mark Cavendish today he did mm. but that hasn't been the rule that's been the exception um, I think that's an important footnote really well it's something he talked about in Rich's Kilometer Zero episode with, called The Escape Artist uh, how he justifies to the rest of the team and the management sitting at the back a lot not joining in and doing a great deal of work but of course um, Dimension Data have lost Mark Renshaw a good 10 days ago probably now isn't it and so they've had to call in other people we saw Tekla Heimer not doing a bit of work on the front the other day and Cavendish was obviously feeling good he made that split didn't he at the finish which surprised me a bit but then when the sprint then opened up you know he wasn't uh, one of the ones that was coming forwards he was one of the ones going backwards and just go but to go back to Alaphilippe I think it's staggering that he's ridden the tour that he has. I mean, he's been in the thick of the action from day one. Oh, text message. Um, <laughs> he he really didn't have much of a, a base in terms of training this winter. He was suffering from a virus for several months over the winter. And 
Essex Quips Quick Step had grave concerns about his. Oh, another one. Um, Essex Quick Step had grave concerns about his staying power in this Tour de France and how effective he'd be, particularly in the in the final third of the race. And um, you know, had that terrible crash in the time trial. Was away down the road yesterday had a mechanical problem which foiled him yesterday and then today on the attack again and um, I think it's remarkable even if he didn't do many turns with Tony Martin that he is at the front of the race 24 years old um, at the start of the third week just on ethics quick step though um, I gather Brian Holm was a little bit miffed about the TV motorbikes was he uh, were they too much of a factor in the chase he certainly felt felt they were, and you know, Ethics Quick Step are one of several teams that have had lots of conversations with the UCI about this issue this year and in previous years. But particularly this year, um, I know Mark Cavendish thinks that it is the single biggest factor that falsifies uh, and skews the results of of bike racing currently more than doping, and that it has a bigger effect than anything else. And um, I. Th- Essex Quick Step felt that today was a good example of that with the TV motorbikes getting pretty close to the peloton at certain points and, and really jeopardising Alaphilippe and Martin's advantage. Eurosport, the home of cycling. And now, Pedaler du Charme. Thank you very much to Eurosport for sponsoring the cycling podcast along with Rafa. And Eurosport, of course, sponsor the Daily Pedaler du Charme Award. We posted a picture this morning of Chris Froome uh, proudly brandishing his unironed, extremely creased Peddler de Charme t-shirt. Hopefully that will be... I'm sure Sky have a team of people with ironing boards and irons who can sort that out in their laundry truck. Um, anyway, he got his. Who is who is it today? Um, actually, there were a lot of nominations today for Oscar Gatto, who seemed to stop and help Daniel Teclahymanot, who had a mechanical problem in, in the closing kilometres, and Gatto stopped and, and helped him, which is, you know, that's, that's perfect Peddler de Charme type behaviour. So I'll probably send Lionel off to think off tomorrow um, to, he, to present that. He's an intriguing character, Gatto. Um, I once asked his then direct sportive Luca Shinto about him and why he had not really lived up to expectations as a professional and Luca Shinto told me he's too mad and I said what do you mean by he's too mad and he said e troppo matto he's too matto come un gatto crazy as a cat and I said yeah but what do you mean and he said he's just too crazy and I, I still I've got no idea what he meant it's very confusing isn't it because obviously in Italy he's Oscar the cat but in France he's Oscar the cake Oscar Gatto yes. So uh, schizophrenic kind of uh, existence for the poor guy. No wonder he's a bit all over the shop. The cat that got the cream cake. Oh. Um, but he, well, I, th- I wouldn't have thought being mad and crazy was was a, was a handicap in professional cycling. No. Why would that hold him back? Or professional podcasting. Wow. We were going to talk about the stage owner, Peter Sagan, who had his fan club here today by the looks of things. There were a lot of Slovakians at the finish chanting. and I mean, he must be, he must be the biggest thing in Slovakia since... Lionel Martina Hingis yeah wow yeah ah was that what you meant Rich yeah I was just testing you Swiss oh, right. connection there of course Failed it. Swiss connection yeah. yes of course wow naturalised Swiss um, nice rendition of We Are The Champions by Oleg Tinkov outside the bus well so he, he, Tinkov did say that if Sagan won two more stages he would r- but he was remain. lying Richard <sighs> and I think I told you this in yeah, the podcast did. the other day he did he did Oscar Tink, oh, Oscar Tinkoff, Oleg Tinkoff, <laughs> lying, extraordinary. Well, listen, I mentioned earlier that I spoke to Jen- John Degenkolb at the finish. Degenkolb has now finished fourth in the last three days, uh, two occasions in the last three days, um, which is a, a great sign for anybody who's followed his story. He was involved in that terrible crash at the end of January at a training camp in Calpe involving his team, Giant Alperson, um, and... Warren Bargill was involved in that as well and Bargill did an amazing job for Degenkolb which it was unexpected really I mean it was quite a tricky finish but you know Bargill is a climber and he did a, an amazing real job not had a great tour though old Wawa has he he's not had a, the, the whimsical flaneur has not had where a great where is he on GC he's, wi- he's he lost loads of time yesterday <laughs> yeah loads, he lost over loads, 10 minutes yesterday didn't time. he so he's well um, out of it maybe a stage win uh, is the only thing he can really salvage now but that, that he did a great job for him um, Degenkolb Still wears a blue uh, sort of casing on his finger. Um, you can see the scars as well around his hand and, and his arm from that crash where they were hit head on by a, a car in southern Spain. 
Yeah, we talked about his mood at the finish line. I just wonder how much of that is, you know, maybe he was just looking forward to seeing his family on the rest day and he, he didn't really have too much time to do interviews. But um, I wonder how frustrated he is that he's finished, you know, four, three times now. And I wonder how much that is still affecting him because he still can't really break properly. Well, and it may be that he feels that he's almost reached, a, not a plateau, but... Um, he's reached a sort of challenging point in his recovery. Well, you, you, you know, you read my mind, Daniel, because uh, after speaking to John Denkov, I spoke to his sports director, his coach, sorry, um, Mark Reef at Giant Alperson. So let's hear from Denkov and from and then from Mark Reef. You seem to get a bit bit boxed in there in, in the finish. Can you just talk us through the last couple, couple hundred meters there? Yeah, I was I was not confident enough to uh, yeah, take a take a better position and pick the other side and uh, was was in the end uh, boxed in on the on the right barrier a bit and uh, yeah it was I really had the, the punch and had also the power but uh, yeah I, I just didn't uh, didn't make something out of it and that's uh, that's very unfortunate but uh, yeah that's I'm also happy to be up there and uh, um, uh, to be in the sprint I mean that shows that uh, I'm I'm progressing uh, in doing the Tour de France, and that's also yeah a great uh, a great step. That was an amazing job that Warren Bargill did for you there. Unbelievable! It was uh, it was really uh, huge, and uh, I'm more than thankful uh, to him. Are we seeing John returning to his previous form? Uh, I think not yet, because then he would really sprint uh, for victory. Um, then it would be uh, closer. But uh, he's coming more and more back, and um, yeah, that's good to uh, good to see. Well, if you were to put a percentage on it, you know how how fa- how far away is he from being 100 percent, and how long do you think it'll take him to get there? Well, I think he's uh, improving here day by day. Uh, the first week he, he really had difficulties already to come in the last kilometer and, and from the last kilometer on to still move up and, uh, and follow wheels. Uh, and you saw that uh, three days ago, was it, I think, uh, that uh, the first time that he got fourth, uh, that, uh, that he really could do a sprint already and uh, full in the wind. And you could see that today uh, again, um, while the final was uh, uh, yeah, very much uh, harder. And um, yeah, also in that case, uh, you see him improving. The, the the group was not too big anymore. You see the classic riders uh, that were um, that were here, so also the strong guys. And yeah, um, I think it's uh, it's difficult also to say how at, at how many percent uh, he's uh, he's at at the moment. Uh, but yeah, you can see that he's improving and that he's coming closer and closer to uh, to a very good shape. And yeah, we are very happy with that. Do, do, you can see his fingers still very heavily strapped. Does that affect him in, in the sprint? Is he able to get the sound pull on the bars okay? Yeah, that's not a, that's not a problem. It's more physically that uh, he started in May again after seven months of uh, without a race. What well, is very long. Uh, all the ri- all the other riders had already their preparation and, and all the other races. So he's running behind all those uh, guys and. Yeah, only with um, um, we planned with California and Dauphiné, uh, I think a very good uh, block of races, but also tra- that he could train uh, in between. Um, yeah, but only the, the the shape in the beginning of the tour was not immediately there yet. But yeah, you see that uh, that with this race, with with uh, with the days, it's getting better and better. And I think that we uh, normally after the tour that we will see uh, the the old uh, John Denkob back again. So we heard there from John Denkob and. They always very approachable. Mark Reef, um, Degen Cobb, as we mentioned earlier, is, is off to pastures new at the end of this year. But you know they, they're clearly backing him, supporting him, and uh, not sure that he'll win a stage at this tour. But <laughs> I think he's on the road to recovery. Um, he's not riding the Vuelta, incidentally. Uh, Mark Reef told me uh, last night there was a. I can't remember how this came about, but I think Laura Messiger saw a picture that was posted on Twitter of us podcasting by the rubbish bins and it looked so glamorous that she was uh, keen to, to ask to be involved in the podcast. A few listeners agreed that that would be a great thing. So I went and found Laura today and, um, and I had a chat to her about, you know, she's Spanish obviously, so keen to get an insight into what's going on at Movie Star, especially with the next few days coming up. Here is Laura Messiger. Laura, after you committed last night to coming on the podcast, I thought, I thought I'd take you up on that. Uh, and obviously it was a popular thing among our listeners, a big clamour for you to appear on the podcast. You've appeared before, but um, how's your Tour de France going? 
Super good, thank you. Because uh, tomorrow is the rest day. <laughs> it, I remember speaking to you at the Giro and you found the Giro pretty tiring. I think we all did. Has is, is the tour been a bit less stressful? Uh, a little bit stressful, but harder, no? I don't know, this second week almost killed me. But the good thing is that tomorrow we have the rest day and then you are in stage 17. So that's You're talking a lot about the rest day. This is obviously <laughs> uppermost in your mind. No, I know. I'm so happy today. You can't imagine. Now, Laura, um, you're Spanish, so you can maybe give us an insight into the big Spanish team, Movistar. Um, so far, they don't seem to have shown an awful lot. That could be because Quintana doesn't look maybe as strong as he has in the past. But they have said all along, that it's all about the third week for them. Are we going to revise our assessment of them over the course of this week, do you think? Uh, yesterday I was asking the same to Arrieta. Like, last year we had to wait until the very last day to see Quintana attacking in the mountain. And he was not referring to Quintana, but to Froome, saying, we hope he's not showing the, fa the same first signs of weakness that day. So it's not his, like he's saying, no, I hope Quintana is strong enough to attack... Uh, I don't know, on Wednesday. Mm. So I hope we can see some action. But uh, I don't know if you read that uh, Valverde said also that uh, Pulse is, is, is setting the pace really, really high. So in that case, it's really difficult to attack. I, I, I would really love to see an alliance between everybody like Astana, <laughs> you know, Movistar, Trek. I don't know, to, at least to see some action. No? But we've seen how strong Sky are in the mountains. Is, is it not pretty pointless to take them on in that terrain? I mean, we've seen Froome steal a bit of time on a descent on a flat stage. Should his rivals and the rival teams not be trying to do that to him rather than him do that to them? Yeah, you mean that the other ones, they should, like, attack, move? or Yeah, I think so, too. At least you try, no? Because uh, Quintana, what is fourth right now? And you have to try because to, to keep the fourth place, it's, uh, it's not probably worth it no how about Quintana and Valverde I mean Valverde, there's always this question of how united they are Valverde's obviously ridden the Giro and come here to support Quintana but they're they're close now on GC is, is Valverde still supporting Quintana or is he maybe thinking of his own overall position no it's really clear I mean, at least to me that I know Valverde a little bit that he's here to support Quintana Maybe he doesn't have the qualities of a great domestic because he hasn't been in that place before. But when you know Valverde, you know he doesn't have any, like, um, he's not super ambitious. Like, he, he runs over the, their teammates to have a, I don't know, a place in the podium and so on. He's fighting for him, for Nairo. We saw it, at least he tried, we saw it yesterday. But I don't know, maybe we see that he's in a super shape again. So what, maybe Movistar should... Uh, play the card with him I don't know Have you spoken much to Quintana and, and how is he? Yeah, not much I'm talking a lot with uh, Valverde to be honest because he's so really open every day and very relaxed Nairo, I think um, what can we say? His messages are always very are, are confident very short so you don't really know I think he was more spontaneous in 2013 and so on now I think he's a bit monitori monitory side. there's more pressure on him now the, yeah. the, the, the perspective we have the sense that we have is that, the, the, that he's not handling that pressure all that well yeah there's a lot of pressure now I think he handled well the pressure I don't know but uh, we see that like all the pressure is on them like someone really wants to find a big rival for Chris Froome at least we have the I don't know the hope that um, we can see some battle now and I don't know I, I see him confident but I really want to see like everybody some fight or some moves don't we all but first of all we want to see the rest day so enjoy <laughs> yes. enjoy the rest day Lara <laughs> thank you very much you too you are listening to the cycling podcast in association with Rafa. Whoever you are, wherever you ride, whatever the reason, Rafa exists to improve your ride. With the finest kit, inspiring stories, and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. See rafa.cc for more information. Thank you very much to Rafa for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast at this race and their alternative coverage of the tour. More than a race can be found at their website, rafa.cc. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, our second 
little podcast for members of the Rafford Cycling Club will be released on the rest day when we take a break. Although Kilometer Zero is coming out on the rest day and today's was about the Quebec Foundation. Tomorrow's Lionel is about... Uh, it's about the thorny issue of disc brakes in the professional peloton um, which I've made with the very capable help of Kaylee Fretz from Velo News who is a expert on an expert on all things technical he understands these things far better than I and his input was invaluable uh, thank you very much I should say to Lara Messenger Messenger sorry <laughs> saying that again thank you very much I should say to Lara Messenger and I realised that in the previous part I was saying Lara and Laura interchangeably that was just to cover all bases sure, sure, to, mind, to, to, to satisfy the, 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 the English speaking audience and the Spanish speaking audience but Rob Hatch would no doubt disapprove of that Lara of course is a Spanish pronunciation <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, corrections and clarifications. Oh, this, I, this we, could we had go a, on. a lot, a lot of errors last night. I, I said the mistakenly that Mikel Nievi finished fifth in the 2013 Tour de France. He finished twelfth. Where did I, you get that from? I thought, I thought he finished fifth. I had it in my head. He finished fifth. I don't know. I said uh, uh, Thibaut Pino had won in Pontalier. He hadn't. He won in Porrentois in Switzerland. Uh, just got my. P name town. Eric yeah. Decker won in Pontalia. He did. That was the day of the massive break, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I also said that Pantano was a very irritating guy to ride on a break <laughs> hey, with. You didn't say won the ninety eight Giro <laughs> Tour double, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Marco Chap. Pantano. Oh my word. <laughs> yeah, we, we yeah we uh, got that wrong. No, no, I got my Colombians mixed up. It was Darwin Atapuma who was annoying Joe Dombrowski at the Giro. Apologies for that. I don't know. I, I just your brain freezes sometimes, doesn't it? I, I knew he was a Colombian. It's the heat, isn't it? Uh, we're not good in the heat, are we? Us, <laughs> us pasty bricks. I knew it was that. Daniel's I mean, fine. I mean, look at him. He looks Mediterranean. He's Mediterranean. Yeah. He's, he's coping much better than mm. we are, Lionel. Mm. Um, and anything else? I, I, I want to plug also just finally something we mentioned last night. Daniel, put that microphone down, Daniel. Um, our second Cycling Podcast Feminine comes out on the rest day. Uh, one of these comment to zero or cycling podcast feminine will be the 300th podcast of the cycling podcast career life as wow. a podcaster yeah wow so we don't know which one it'll be yet because it depends which one goes out first or it depends which one goes out second actually yeah. but our second cycling podcast feminine has got a big feature marianne voss it's got some stuff from the women's tour the giro rosa and lots of good stuff from myself and all the shinoe so you'll find that in the usual place the usual channel are we not going to talk about movistar yeah, well, that's, talk what, about that's what Laura, in frooms La- and Laura was talking about, movie star. And, and You're not going to ask me about Quintana. whether other people should be attacking Froome? Well, okay, so we've got these four days in the Alps that everybody's been talking about and everybody's been looking forward to it and it feels almost anticlimactic already because we suspect that Froome and Sky are too strong. It's rubbish, isn't it? Uh, the rubbish, people saying that they should have attacked more, everyone else should have attacked more. I'll tell you why, Richard. Because... No one can attack, can they? Sky are way too strong. And they're you know, the strongest GC contenders are only as strong as Walt Powell's and Sergio Henao. Also, Sky are operating this rotation policy, so they're only as strong as a f- relatively fresh Walt Powell's and Sergio Henao, who have been able to rest a couple of you know the previous two stages or whatever. Um, Mikel, uh, Mikel Lander, the same thing. Also, I think there are a lot of guys in the general classification who have got a lot to lose, who are very, very happy where they are. Richie Port's happy where he is. Dan Martin's happy where he is. Adam Yates, um, Roman Barde, I could go on. Um, a lot of them are renegotiating new contracts. So it's an awful lot to ask to expect them to put everything on the line, um, you know, and, and, and attack 60, 70, 80, 100 kilometers from the finish one day, which is what it's going to take. Um, the only rider who's done that in recent years, Alberto Contador. Why has Alberto Contador been able to do that? Because he has already achieved pretty much everything in cycling and um, hasn't got the same amount to lose as those guys or hasn't had the same amount to lose as those guys have currently. Yeah, can't disagree with any of that. Um, yeah, I mean... That's, that's, that's but that still doesn't are. answer the question of why Movistar don't do a little bit more with their two very well placed guys. I mean, they're they're basically riding around France together. They haven't yet risked anything, knowing that one of them can can remain sure, in a very so high Quintana position. Has not, has not, I think he's has ill. not taken any risks, and I think there he's is Ill. a rumor mm. that he's ill. So yeah, that mm. could that could uh, scupper him. He certainly doesn't look as. He's offered nothing. He doesn't look as good as, as he's looked the last couple of years. And, you know, at his age, we expect to see some progression this year, some continual improvement. I did put, yeah. it, I did put it to Lara that, I mean, this is probably the first tour he's come to 
as many people's favourite, and that does alter things a little bit. You know, going from underdog to somebody who people expect to mm. to win. I think he's he's been miscast almost throughout his career. Naira Quintana as this kind of explosive mercurial um, f- sort of free electron who will you know turn a race upside down. I don't think he's that rider at all. I think he is essentially a follower, um, and I think he's a follower until the deep into the third week of races i think he's a diesel and you know he'll probably come to the fore at the end of this race but it doesn't look as It'll though it's going to be, gonna be so enough what, what he needs is for Froome to 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 fade capitulate to capitulate basically. so really his whole sort of his whole uh, reputation is forged on about half an hour annecy semnos from 20 yeah and stay 13. 13 you know yeah. like tirreno adriatico last year when he won in the snow you know there was a spectacular attack then but that's march you know mm. it's a big there's a big difference between that and the tour de france and I, d- I also don't think he i think he has quite a conservative temperament um as far as a racer because i think he's too gritty and too stoic to actually you know throw caution to the wind i think he he's too determined too ambitious he really is desperate to win this tour de france and he knows that ultimately he, attacking 50 kilometers from the finish is just stupid until you know it, until the penultimate stage or the last mountain stage when perhaps it's justified oh well that calls pour, pours that that pours cold water on the rest of the week doesn't it not necessarily. We can still see some really good racing. I just don't think... I mean, yeah, this, this was the point I made in the podcast yesterday or the day before about the more the stages are backloaded into the final week. We've had Mont Ventoux on the penultimate day. We've had Alpe d'Huez on the penultimate day in recent years. Actually, it's, you, you have to go back to 2011 bef- to the last time the yellow jersey changed shoulders in the final week. It's been done and done from 2012 onwards from a really early point often as early as the second weekend and that's an interesting um, you know that's a really interesting problem for Thierry Gouvenu Christian Prudhomme looking forward to the, the coming years they want to they want the sense of drama and suspense to all be in the second half of the race and in the last weekend of the race they want the dream of something amazing happening on the last Friday or Saturday but actually Chris Froome has completely punctured that balloon by attacking on a descent and attacking on I mean, the flat, pinching little bits of yeah, time we were when saying, least expected. Yeah, we were, that, and that's what rivals should have been doing, or trying to do at least, not not taking them on on the climbs where Team Sky are so strong. Um, you know, we've seen before strong, dominant teams in the sport, so this is not a new thing at all. But our friend Mick Bennett would, of course, say, reduce the team size. I mean, that, mm. that would be a, a yeah. really good way Agreed. of uh, just putting more of an onus on fewer people and there would be more there would be more cracks in Team Sky's yeah, armory yeah it would neutralise some of Sky's advantage um, I think Brexit might neutralise yes. some of Sky's well it advantage. cuts their budget by it does cut their budget a, lo- a lot um, you mentioned Thierry Gouverneau did you mention his little cameo on our, our table at bourg en or is, have we spoken enough about the meal in bourg en no we haven't Good spoken about it at all <laughs> The chicken, unbelievable, the chicken. unbelievable. The Thirty-five Lionel's euro chicken. Lionel's very unhappy about memorable, it. Memorable, memorable, Lionel. I will never forget that meal. Final, final point. Do you want me to pay you no, back? No, no. Do you want me Rich. to pay you back? I will gladly pay you back <laughs> Rich, for your chicken Rich. if you just shut up about it, <laughs> Rich. Rich, you said um, we were, t- were talking then about you know who could be unpredictable in the final week. You know, you, you already mentioned Jarlin and Pantani. I mean, that guy. You know, Pantano. he's won major tours. He's <laughs> oh, he's won mountain that. stages galore in the past. You never know with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and on that, oh, on that, on that, that note, note, let's end it there. Yeah. Um, Daniel, enjoy your rest day. Have you got a busy rest day? Um, Sky, Dimension Data, and then I'm going to be stocking up on Rivella, hopefully. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, Thank Daniel. You. It's Thank great to have the band back together, isn't it? Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Mm. Woo. I want you back. <laughs> I want you back. Oh, oh, dear. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Lionel. <laughs>